yellow or gold Something much more colorful Hello and welcome to Green TV. I'm Tom Brown, your host this evening. Uh, Green TV is brought to you by the St. Joe Valley Greens in South Bend, Indiana. Please check out our website and come visit us at our monthly meetings. Scott Ritter is neither a Democrat nor a progressive. Scott Ritter is a former Marine war planner. He targeted bombs for the Marine Corps in the first Gulf War. Ritter voted for George Bush in 2000. Scott Ritter was a United Nations weapons inspector with intimate knowledge of the security and Iraq policies of the Clinton administration and the current Bush administration. Scott Ritter is against the war in Iraq. Ritter spoke to activist San Diego on Martin Luther King Day, Monday, January 20th, 2003. His purpose was to prevent a war in Iraq if possible. How is it that an avowed warrior and a former supporter of George Bush Jr. became a peace activist? Join us as we listen to part one of Scott Ritter's tale. Okay, we'll see if we can make this work. First of all, thank you very much for, for coming tonight. It certainly is a, um, an honor and a privilege to, to be here and to talk to you about uh, an issue that, uh, you know, regardless of where you stand on the, on the matter, um, no one can debate that it's, it's not one of the more defining moments of our time, the issue of war and peace and whether or not our nation is going to, in fact, engage in a war that may cost uh, us thousands of lives of our own uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine, and may cost the lives of uh, many tens of thousands of Iraqis. I think we uh, have a duty and responsibility as American citizens before we head down the path towards war to, you know, take the time. We owe it to those who wear the uniform, who serve our country so proudly, to take the time to debate, discuss, engage in an open dialogue about this, this issue. Is there a cause worthy of war? Is there justification for the sacrifice we're asking these brave patriots to make in our name? And we should never forget that. Those who wear the uniform of the United States of America wear our uniform. They're our soldiers. They're our sailors. They're our Marines. And therefore, we have a duty and a responsibility as American citizens to insist that those whom we elect to higher office exhaust every venue possible short of war before going to war. So that's one of the main reasons why I wrote the book Endgame is to discuss the issue in Iraq, to lay out my perceptions uh, regarding the nature of Iraq, the nature of its brutal, tyrannical regime. Under no circumstances should anybody ever misconstrue my opposition to a war with Iraq as somehow being sympathetic to the tyrant Saddam Hussein. There is no sympathy in my heart for the tyrant Saddam Hussein. My heart goes out to America, to the United States of America, to the Constitution for which we stand, and for those who serve our country so proudly. Those are whom I'm out here demonstrating on behalf of. Um, I'm also demonstrating on behalf of international law and the concept of law. And I should remind everybody that, you know, when we speak of international law, it isn't necessarily in direct uh, opposition to the concept of American law. In fact, when you read the Constitution, and I'm a big fan of the Constitution, Article 6 of the Constitution says that when we sign or enter into an agreement that has been ratified by two-thirds of the U.S. Senate, that is the law of the land here in America. We are signatories to the United Nations Charter, and therefore we are obliged to abide by the United Nations Charter. And we should never forget that the United Nations Charter forswears war as a means of resolving disputes between nations that the ideal manner to, in which we do resolve these is through the process of law. Now, the United Nations Charter does recognize that situations may exist that threaten international peace and security. That's why the United Nations Charter creates the Security Council. And it says that the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter can determine that a threat to international peace and security exists that warrants military intervention. But when we take a look at what's happening with Iraq today, you'll see that the United States is pushing aggressively forward on the issue of going to war and not paying due heed to the will of the Security Council. The Council has mandated the return of weapons inspectors. Indeed, weapons inspectors are in Iraq today. 
It's not a black and white situation. Will Iraq comply or won't they? It's way too early in the process to, to, to tell what the final outcome of the inspection process will be. But what is clear is that the will of the international community, the will of the Security Council is that we must give the inspectors time, all the time necessary to finish their job before we talk about going to war. And yet the United States is pushing forward. We run the very dangerous uh, potential of us getting involved in a military action in Iraq void of international support, operating outside the framework of international law. What this means is a couple things. A, that when we engage with Iraq, we will not only in, in get ourselves involved in the conflagration in that nation, but we will also destabilize the entire region, condemning the United States to perpetual conflict for years to come. A conflict that can only mean bad things, not only for our nation, but the world at large. Two, and I say this as a former Marine who spent 12 years proudly wearing that uniform, serving my country, having fought in the first Gulf War, we will be sending hundreds of thousands of our service members off to fight in a war that will not have the full support of the American people. This is a shame. Didn't we learn our lesson in Vietnam? You know, it's those who wear the uniform of the United States military are not to blame for the policies of the government. They're out there serving our country, and it's incumbent upon us as a people to give them our full support, but it has to be in a cause worthy of support. That is why I believe these demonstrations that swept the nation over this weekend said not only no to war, but they also said yes to international law. I believe the majority of the American people would regretfully support military action against Iraq if we had the full support of the international community, if there was a cause, if Iraq was found to be in violation of its obligations, if Iraq was found to be a threat to the United States. All of this may be. The future may indeed uh, uncover you know, weapons of mass destruction, uncover plotting by Saddam Hussein against our country. And if that is the case, woe be it to Saddam Hussein and Iraq, because war will come with all the horror of war. But we cannot prejudge the outcome. And not only that, we cannot only limit ourselves to the concept of a military solution. We must open ourselves up to you know, thinking about alternatives to war, how we can resolve this problem short of war. And that's why I called the book Endgame, Solving the Iraq Crisis, because war is not an endgame. War is a path to nowhere. War is about death and destruction. War, you know, is, represents basically a failure of mankind, because war is about human beings killing human beings. Unfortunately, we are human, and sometimes we head down that path. But I would like to believe that, again, because we are human, because we are thinking beings, that we can come up with solutions to this problem that do not require us to stain the moral character of the United States of America by engaging in a needless conflict. Endgame, solving the Iraqi crisis, speaks of opening up the possibility of diplomatic solutions, taking a look at alternatives such as diplomatic engagement, liberating the Iraqi people, not through an invasion, but through the lifting of economic sanctions, and considering a whole host of other options that will improve the human rights of Iraq. Uh, and remember, human rights is a two-way street. It's not simply about Saddam Hussein oppressing the Iraqi people. That is definitely an equation that must be dealt with. Iraq must conform to internationally accepted standards of human rights. But it's also about the international community understanding the international community's obligation to the Iraqi people by lifting economic sanctions, by ensuring that the Iraqi people can spend their national resources the way they see fit. It's, it's a complicated question, and there's no simple solution. But believe me, sitting down, debating, discussing this issue, coming up with alternatives short of war, is what we owe not only to those who wear the uniform, but to everyone who calls himself an American. Because America does stand for something. It stands for freedom. It stands for liberty. It stands for values, ideals that we must adhere to if we are to call ourselves Americans. So again, thank you for being here tonight. I'll be more than happy to take questions from anybody. Okay, the, right. the question is, am I familiar with the U.S. House bill? And I don't know the number, HR? HR Twenty-four fifty-nine to establish a Department of Peace. I believe uh, Dennis Kucinich, the yes, representative. Right. No, I am familiar with it. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, Representative Kucinich. Um, you know, I again, I'm going to be brutally honest here. I'm a I'm a former Marine. I'm a warrior. Uh, I'm not a pacifist, although I'm now 
pushing a, a path towards peace because I do know what war is and I, and I understand its horrors. Um, you know, anything we can do to develop a framework of thinking, of, of a process within the bureaucracy of the U.S. government that promotes peace. Right now it seems that the United States government is, you know, unbalanced in the direction of resolving conflicts, resolving crises through military force. Uh, we've given up the concept of engagement, discussion, diplomacy, and we go to the gun uh, quicker than maybe we should. So, yeah, I think a Department of Peace might be a good idea. I'm not a bureaucrat. I'm not an expert on U.S. government and how that such a department would be formed, but I just think the concept of promoting peace um, before we promote war would be a sound, sound policy. Could I just ask you one favor? Because you were on Phil Donahue. You must know Phil Donahue. Could you tell him to please have Puccinich on his show and start talking about to get a debate going? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best, but I can't say that I have a direct link with Mr. Donahue. Okay, yes, sir. Could I clarify why weapons inspectors left Iraq in 19, uh, 1998? I can, but I'm going to put it in a broader context. For inspections to work in Iraq, we have to understand there, there's three conditions. One, Iraq must fully comply with its obligation to disarm. Iraq has an obligation to fully cooperate with the weapons inspectors. Void of Iraqi cooperation, you cannot have a successful inspection. Two, the Security Council, in passing laws that require inspectors to go to work and disarm Iraq, must be willing to enforce that law. So if you run into a situation where Iraq is not in compliance, you must be willing to step up to the plate and enforce your law. What good's a law unless it's enforced? And three, if you're going to hold Iraq accountable to the rule of law, say you must disarm, we have to ensure that those who implement the rule of law, the weapons inspectors themselves, are held accountable to the rule of law. That is, when you go into Iraq, to disarm Iraq, that is what your mandate is, to get rid of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. There is no Security Council resolution authorizing regime removal. In fact, if you study not only all Security Council resolutions, you, and you'll, you'll find that there is no mention of regime removal, but read the United Nations Charter. It specifically prohibits regime removal. And again, I come back to Article 6 of the Constitution. We're signatories of the United Nations Charter. So when you hear the President say, our policy in Iraq is regime removal, what the president is saying is our policy in Iraq is in violation of international law and in violation of the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, having said that, we come to 1998. We're in a situation where Iraq is not fully cooperating. No one should ever forget that, that there was not full cooperation by the Iraqi government from 1991 to 1998. Two, the Security Council was unwilling to back up the inspectors, wasn't willing to step up to the plate. But three, the United States had a policy of regime removal that had been in place since 1991 that corrupted the integrity of the inspection operation. The United States used the weapons inspectors and the unique access inspections afforded the inspectors to the most sensitive sites inside Iraq to spy on Saddam's security, to gather information about Saddam Hussein's security and to use that information actively to foment his overthrow. From 1993 to 1998, there were five CIA-sponsored assassination slash coup attempts against Saddam Hussein saying that used intelligence information derived from the inspection process. So we had a very complicated situation. In December 1998, the United States manipulated the inspection process one last time. They put weapons inspectors in, in Iraq. Again, Richard Butler, the Australian diplomat who headed the weapons inspection process, ordered the inspectors in, but he did it in a hand-in-glove relationship with Sandy Berger, the national security advisor. They coordinated timelines of inspection with timelines of military action. They sent the weapons inspectors in to be deliberately provocative. Um, to, give, uh, in, to define this, understand that from 1995, uh, 1996 to 1998, we had an agreement with the Iraqis about inspecting sensitive sites. They called the modalities for sensitive site inspections. It, it meant that if we went to a site that Iraq felt was dealt with its national security, we would limit the number of inspectors going in to four. And then if the inspectors found anything relevant to their work, all the inspectors could come in. If the inspectors didn't find anything, if it was simply an intelligence facility, a security facility, then the inspection was done. This agreement was in place, and it worked. The United States instructed Richard Butler to scrap the modalities of sensitive site inspections without going to the Security Council. So the inspectors showed up in Iraq, went to a facility in downtown Baghdad. The Iraqis said, come on in with the modalities. This is a sensitive site because it was the Ba'ath Party headquarters. It had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, everything to do with Iraq's political sensitivities. Iraq said, though, you can inspect it. They even said you can bring in, uh, I think, up to 16 inspectors. But the weapons inspectors, no, said no. 
We're going to scrap the modalities. We'll go in, but the modalities don't apply. We'll just come in. The Iraqi said, I'm sorry, the agreement is the modalities apply. The inspectors refused to back down on Richard Butler's orders, and when the Iraqis said, without the modalities, you can't come in, the inspectors were withdrawn, and what the world was told is that Iraq refused to cooperate with the weapons inspectors. The United States then, the United States then ordered the inspectors out of Iraq, and 24 hours later began bombing Iraq, Operation Desert Fox, a 72-hour bombing campaign, 97 targets, 86 of which dealt with Saddam Hussein's security. All 86 were derived from weapons inspectors' intelligence reports. Okay, the, the, the question related to this massive deployment of military forces that we see both here on the West Coast and also on the East Coast, and believe me, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines are coming from the hinterlands too. All across America, American troops are deploying to the region. Um, do, do I believe that the United States uh, is, is, is listening to the inspectors, is willing to give the inspections a chance, or are we just moving towards war? Well, it's hard, you know, I'm not a member of the Bush administration, obviously, so I can't tell you what, <laughs> what, what the inside thinking is. There's a lot of people out there that, that say, oh, Bush is just bluffing. You know, and many congressmen and senators say, you know, if we don't show the Iraqis that we're serious, they'll never cooperate. So this is probably the most expensive game of chicken ever played. But the problem with this game of chicken is it's not a game. We're talking about war. And I have to tell you, knowing what I know about military deployments, having participated in a massive deployment of troops to the Persian Gulf in, in 1990, 1991, at some point in time, this military deployment will take on a life of its own. You will deploy so much military equipment, so much personnel, you will commit so much political, diplomatic, and economic resources to this deployment that you simply cannot pull back. You will achieve a critical mass, which means war is all but inevitable. And the danger of this is, is that the, the buildup of American military power is not coinciding with the buildup of international support for this war. In fact, you have two exact opposite graph lines. As American military build power builds up, international support, and indeed domestic support for this war, is declining. The community, international community said they will not support a war with Iraq without a second Security Council resolution. And the Security Council has said clearly that they will not pass a resolution authorizing war until they have a smoking gun, until the weapons inspectors have come out and said Iraq is not cooperating or Iraq has weapons. So the, ins the international community said, give the inspectors a chance. I have to tell you, as a professional weapons inspector for seven years, give the inspectors a chance means the following. Six months to a year. The inspectors were out of Iraq for nearly four years. When I resigned in 1998, I testified to the U.S. Senate that once you remove weapons inspectors from the equation in Iraq, Iraq could reconstitute significant aspects of its programs within six months. They had four years to reconstitute it and hide, potentially. I'm not saying they did it. I'm saying the potential's there. And given the stakes at hand here, we have to give the inspectors every opportunity to thoroughly investigate this issue, to do their job. Donald Rumsfeld and others in the administration have denigrated the inspectors, saying they cannot work. But I think, if anything, the events of last week prove the inspectors can work. They found 11 warheads. They found 3,000 pages. They're putting pressure on the Iraqis, and they're doing a good job. We just have, need to give them more time to do it. But the danger is the Bush administration isn't going to be able to give them that time because we are accelerating this military buildup so that conflict with Iraq seems all but inevitable by the end of February. Yes, sir, in the back. Administration and Sandy Berger did what they did in 98. Let's first of all remember that they inherited the situation. I'm not a big fan of Bill Clinton, but with all due respect to him, he inherited the situation. He didn't create this situation. He inherited it from the first President Bush, who left an unresolved situation that, that talked about dealing with Iraq by containing Iraq, not solving the problem. So he inherited a problem of containment. You know, when Bill Clinton first came into office, he made a statement. He said, I'm a good Southern Baptist, and I believe in deathbed conversions. And maybe we can just get Saddam Hussein to change his ways. And as soon as he said that, all American politicians, Democratic and Republicans, slapped him down. Because <coughs> Saddam Hussein had been demonized to such an extent in the political psyche of the American people that you know, engagement with Saddam Hussein was inconceivable politically. Any politician who said, hey, let's maybe reopen diplomatic relations with Iraq and solve this thing diplomatically, feared for their political future. So Clinton continued this policy of, of, of containment. But can, containment isn't a policy. Containment is the absence of policy. Containment means we don't know what we're doing to solve this situation, so we're just going to put a big circle around it and hold it in place. 
Containment meant that the Iraqi people are condemned to perpetual suffering because of economic sanctions. Containment meant that the entire region is condemned to perpetual instability because of this American military buildup, this constant to and fro with, uh, with Iraq. Containment meant because we have a policy of regime removal that until we get rid of Saddam Hussein, there's not a solution. It meant that we closed the door on any possibility of Saddam Hussein cooperating with the inspectors. Because if you say, you know, the international law says that once Iraq cooperates, once Iraq is found to be in compliance, economic sanctions will be lifted. But when the United States has a policy that says no matter what Iraq does, even if they comply, we will not lift sanctions until, until Saddam Hussein is removed from power, you know, you've suddenly screwed up the entire uh, political, geopolitical, uh, diplomatic equation. Bill Clinton had a problem because every time we had a crisis with Iraq, he wasn't willing to go all the way. I talked about enforcement of law. Let's be serious. When we're talking about enforcing a law that deals with Iraq, we have to make sure that it, the enforcement affects that which makes the decision in Iraq. And Iraq is a dictatorship. Saddam Hussein is the decision maker. So if you're going to enforce something with Iraq, you have to put pressure on Saddam. You have to threaten his very existence before he'll wake up and, and understand that they're serious. Bill Clinton was never willing to take it to that level, so Iraq found out that they could get away with obstructing the inspectors. Then the Americans would build up and Iraq would give away just enough to have the build up go down. So you had this constant cycle of build up, escalation, de-escalation, and it was very expensive monetarily and it's very damaging politically because Bill Clinton was always raising expectations. So finally the Clinton administration did the age-old political thing of say one thing, do another. And uh, to give you an example, on April 6th, 1998, Bill Clinton spoke to the U.S. Congress and said, it is the policy in the United States to do everything we can to support the weapons inspectors. Whatever the inspectors say they need, we will provide. And then they turned around and passed a secret U.S. policy that said, stop the inspectors from being confrontational. So when I would go into Iraq at the head of a weapons inspection team, fully mandated to do our task, with search warrants signed by the United Nations to do the job, we would show up in Iraq and the United States would pull the rug out from under our feet and we couldn't do our job. Bill Clinton uh, did what he did because he didn't have the, uh, the courage either to decisively confront Iraq on this issue or to recognize that this policy that we were had in, in, in regards to Iraq was a failure, that we needed new and innovative ways of dealing with Iraq, such as perhaps a, a more vibrant dip, uh, diplomatic engagement. Do you think his disdain for the military contributed to that? Do I think his disdain to, for the military contributed to that? You know, I think when Bill Clinton became president, he, he learned a lot about the military he didn't know before he became president. And I don't believe that that disdain uh, is reflective of how he treated the military during his eight years. I'm not a big fan of Bill Clinton, but I think he learned to respect the U.S. military. And I think by the time, you know, he, he had a couple months under his belt as president, he realized that the military is, is a proud institution that serves America honorably. And I don't think he did bad by the military. He's, you know, of course, not the military's greatest person, but he... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think he had that kind of disdain as president. Yes, sir. Leashing a biological or a chemical warfare. And what's the mechanism of that? Does he have the delivery capability of, what do we have, 20,000 people in Kuwait? Can he knock out those 20,000 people with biological or chemical warfare? Okay. The question dealt with Iraq's, uh, uh, the vulnerability of our troops to an Iraqi chemical and biological attack. Does Saddam Hussein have the capability of launching a preemptive strike against our thousands of I troops deployed? Or even an attack, if we attack. If we attack. Sure, I th and I think the CIA has issued a report that said that, you know, the biggest risk comes if we invade Iraq. It's very unlikely that Iraq would launch a preemptive strike, et cetera. Well, first thing is, that presumes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons. You know, a lot of speculation existed about Iraq's chemical and biological weapons program before the inspectors got back in because everybody said, you know, what do we know what they did in those four years where inspectors weren't there? But we have inspectors there now. Weapons of mass destruction are not produced in a vacuum. They're produced by a confluence of industry, science, technology. When you produce a weapon of mass destruction, you leave trace evidence. The inspectors to date have carried out over 400 inspections, including inspections of all the relevant industrial facilities in Iraq that could be used by Iraq to produce chemical and biological weapons, and they found no evidence of Iraqi manufacturing of these weapons. There's no trace evidence. View Iraq as a crime scene. 
You know, we suspected Saddam Hussein of the crime of producing or retaining weapons of mass destruction. View the inspectors as crime scene investigators. They are equipped with some of the most sophisticated detection equipment in the world. They can detect one to one hundred millionth of a particle. So go to a chemical facility around San Diego and look how messy these places are. You don't do things with chemicals without leaving spillage around. You can't clean everything up. And these inspectors will find evidence. The CIA had a priority list. We got to see some of it at Americans. Uh, last fall when Donald Rumsfeld and others briefed us repeatedly, these are the sites that, Iraq are re that Iraq's rebuilding, that were bombed and Iraq's rebuilding. It's these places where Iraq's building these weapons, and this is why we have to go to war now to hold Iraq accountable to prevent, you know, a smoking gun or a mushroom cloud. The inspectors have inspected every single one of these sites to date, all the CIA sites of concern, and they've reported nothing's there. So now the question is, what weapons does Iraq have? Well, as long as you have weapons inspectors in Iraq, you know, there's no way they're going to have a viable weapons program. Um, if they did, it would have to be buried someplace in the ground, and eventually the inspectors will find it. And it'll have to be of such a small quantity, because it's not going to be massive in nature, that it's militarily not viable. Uh, the biggest danger we face isn't from Iraqi chemical or biological weapons attack. To be honest, you know, the uh, bio, we, we, biological weapon, the only one that Iraq produced in large numbers that, that was of any... Um, impact was anthrax. It was liquid bulk agent. They never weaponized it properly. The only way an Iraqi biological bomb or shell was going to kill you is if it landed on your head. Because if it missed you, it would just put a hole in the ground, break open, the sludge would break out, it'd spill in the ground, and, and, and nothing happens. And their chemical weapons weren't that good either. But the, again, we, there's no evidence they have them. The biggest danger we face is as we close in on Baghdad, we come in on a massive conglomeration of urban uh, concentration. Uh, Baghdad is a city the size of Detroit with five million people. Surrounding Baghdad are a number of very established urban areas. We're going to have to fight through these areas. That's the number one threat facing American troops in Iraq today, I believe, is urban warfare. Do you think Saddam Hussein is suicidal? Do you think he'd be willing to accept, you know, he realizes what we can do to him in 20 minutes or an hour, wipe out all his palaces and so forth. Do you think he's willing to accept that kind of a... I don't believe Saddam Hussein's suicidal. I believe Saddam Hussein is about one thing and one thing only, and that's the continued survival of Saddam Hussein. But I will tell you this, Saddam Hussein is somebody, he's not going to leave Iraq. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld can wistfully believe that Saddam Hussein is going to run off to exile, but that isn't going to happen. Saddam Hussein will fight, and Saddam Hussein will die in Iraq. Um, and he believes that he can exact a horrendous toll on the United States of America. Uh, he believes also that he can hold off the uh, ultimate American victory long enough so that the entire region explodes and that the United States will never be able to, you know, achieve its final objective. And given the limited number of troops that we're talking about here, you know, Rumsfeld is only talking about deploying 250 to 300,000. When we took over Kuwait, it took 600,000. And now we're talking about taking over all of Iraq. And we speak of, you know, precision weapons, new intelligence, etc. In a city, all that stuff goes out the window when it comes an infantryman against an infantryman in a confined area and it's some of the most bloody, horrific fighting imaginable. Yes, sir. Uh, like